Fabulous. Well, today we're Dinah and I are going to share an update of what we know about what's happening on the Arizona border. We spoke to you at the beginning of November and shared what was at that time a very late breaking, fast paced, changing project with the state of Arizona, bringing shipping container walls um, onto the southern border with Sonora. Next slide. I just want to start by saying that every all the land that we're talking about today is native land. Um, the land that's been affected by generations now of border infrastructure has impacted tribal reservation land, tribal reservations, and including the Otham, the Pasqua Yaqui, and the Kokopa Indian tribe, and many other indigenous peoples. Next slide. The topics that uh, we're going to cover today is I'm going to start by talking sort of about the, the rise and fall of shipping container infrastructure. It really, really surprised me this year, but it didn't start this year and it didn't start even in Arizona. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Going to debrief what happened in terms of where the wall <clears throat> of the different segments of wall were installed by the state, the impact that they've had, well, at least what we understand about the impact so far in Arizona. And then Dinah is going to give us an overview of the legal, the legal situation surrounding the shipping container wall. And, and so she'll share a little bit of a recap of what we talked about in November and then present what we know about the legal status today. Next slide. All right, well, may, some of you may already know this, but the shipping containers as a border strategy is really not new, it's not unique to Arizona. They first were shown, they first used by Governor Abbott in Texas, um, being deployed along the Rio Grande. And actually currently now, um, there's a segment of new ship, of shipping containers being placed uh, along the Texas border as well. So this dates back to November of 2021. And then in 2022, of course, the, the great idea was spread to Governor Ducey here in Arizona, and we saw that um, they started to appear and shipping containers were purchased by the state. Next slide. Okay, so here's a context map zooming into Arizona. And what you can see on uh, the map that was put together by Miles Traphagen at Wildlands Network is where border infrastructure over different administrations have been constructed along the southern border of Arizona on the left and New Mexico. The different segments are marked by colors in terms of when the border wall infrastructure was put in and the type of infrastructure that it is. So the red segments are the newest sections of wall that were installed along the border under the Trump administration between 2017 and 2021. Segments of orange predate the Trump administration. They were put in at some point between 2008 and 2017. Those are typically shorter segments, shorter in height, sections of wall only 18 feet tall, but the more recent federal walls were 30 feet high. They're all, all the construction labeled border wall from either, either time period are steel bollard walls. So the, so the sections of four inch bollards that have some, some gaps in between um, the steel segments. There's also a vehicle barrier and that's the yellow and black lined areas. The, that means there are low crossing blockages for vehicles. They are the Normandy style, kind of these big X's that are out on the landscape. They prevent a vehicle from crossing the border, but they're still fairly passable for wildlife. And then they're fairly tiny and hard to see, but in places where border construction was interrupted between the transition from the Trump administration to Biden administration, but there still was construction activities that had pretty severe environmental damage is marked by the turquoise colors. Um, now, the shipping container wall segments, the first one that came on the scene was over on the western end of the state, state in Yuma, very close um, to Kokopa land, but all of it was on 
the Bureau of Reclamation Land. And then the second one was in Cochise County on Coronado National Forest. And I'm gonna share a few statistics about what, what we know about those these two separate sections of wall. Next slide. The Yuma, mall, the Yuma wall was relatively short. It was less than a mile. They were not stacked double high. So there were only 130 containers used in total. As I mentioned, this is on federal land, Bureau of Reclamation land. And the contract was about $13 million to install. Well, it started at a lower amount and then it increased to 13 million for the installation. And then the removal contract is nine, about $9 million to actually remove those containers. And that has happened. Now, the difference, um, one of the big differences between the segment of shipping container wall in Yuma versus Cochise County is that the federal wall has been planned to be built in this location. So part of the Bureau of Reclamation um, management of the situation is acknowledgement of federal wall to be built by Customs and Border Protection. And we don't know exactly when that construction will start, but it was announced as part of the border remediation plan that came out last year. The Cochise Wall, in contrast, was much bigger. <laughs> um, the, the vision was a 10-mile wall that would extend westward from the Montezuma Pass uh, towards the Santa Cruz River, um, but it, they, it was stopped at three and a half miles long. It's more than 900 containers, both shorter containers and the full size. They were double stacked, they were welded together, um, and in stretches of it also they they had concertina wire the razor wire on top now in addition to just the scale of the wall this was placed on different land um, management unit it was also federal land but it's managed by the u.s forest service on coronado national forest this was protected oak woodland which is different from the more agricultural landscape um, in yuma uh, so the, the type of environmental damage that occurred during the installation, and I'll, and I'll go over that, was much more severe along the section of the Cochise Wall. Uh, the, the total plan, uh, contract cost to install or the plan, I, I don't know actually what the contract um, amount was with Ashbrit, but it was stated to be a $95 million project to install the full uh, 10 miles. The new contract for removal is coming in at $57 million, and we don't yet know what the damages and the restoration need and those costs will be, so that's a big question mark. Uh, but the Arizona Republic is, is stating that it's going to be about $200 million in total for the state of Arizona for the, both the, the rise and fall of the wall. And then the big price tag around restoration, like I mentioned, is, is still to be determined. But another key difference with the Cochise County wall is that this is not a place where the federal government had plans to build any new border infrastructure, including a wall. So they went into a new, uh, new section, the state did, and did this um, in a place where no wall has been, been planned. Next slide. Well, the back of the envelope calculation, if it's a $200 million project, which is a lot of money, the state had to did purchase 4,000 shipping containers. So it's about $50,000 per shipping container before the restoration costs. So you'll, you'll never look at one of these shipping containers again, I'm sure, <laughs> in the same way. Next slide. All right, here's a map uh, zooming into what actually happened on the Cochise County Wall in Coronado National Forest. To orient you to where we are, this is um, where you see Coronado Peak Trail. This is very close to where the uh, Arizona Trail comes all the way down to the Mexican border there at Border Monument 102. That's on the, the right side or the eastern side. Uh, this section that is in the black rectangular area is where the decommissioning or the removal of the wall activities are happening right now and the U.S. Forest Service has issued a closure order so it's not lawful to visit within 500 meters of the U.S.-Mexico border in this area. It's roughly from border monument 102 to 104 on the western side. 
the amount of border wall that was put in um, is indicated uh, where the blue markers are along the segment of the border. You can see the eastern terminus. It began on October 24th of last year. And then they progressed to the western terminus, um, which is above the green shaded area, the left or leftmost blue marker, uh, but in mid December. So they were going really quickly at the peak pace of construction, about a tenth of a mile of shipping container wall was being built um, during this time period, but it did slow down and I will, I will talk a little bit more about that. One of the exciting thing is, and that's where the purple, um, the purple hearts are, is as the shipping container has been progressing and being removed, um, it's because it's now being unzipped and it's heading back um, over a mile has already been done, probably higher than that. Um, but given the pace that they were using for removal, it was it was happening relatively quickly. OK, next slide. Now, what does this area look like? Um, this is a picture that I took standing on the, the border road with Sonora on the right side over the vehicle barrier. I was describing those X, steel X's that um, mark the border in this area. And then on the Arizona side, on the left side of the screen, it's Coronado National Forest. The border road ends at some point as you go up into the southern foothills of the Huachuca Mountains. And prior to any federal construction in the area, the vehicle barrier stopped, the, the road stopped, and it was a natural um, mountain crossing between Mexico and the US. Next slide. So in September 2020, things had changed quite a bit. This is after the border construction to build, uh, to extend the physical steel border wall running across the San Pedro and westward through the Huachuca Mountains. They built uh, a border road that zigzags up to Montezuma Pass here. And this area was closed during that construction. But a lot of changes happened when, when the, this federal construction project happened. The wall didn't extend all the way over the Huachuca Mountains in this place. There's just a shark fin of about less than a quarter mile of border wall that was built up on Montezuma Pass. So mostly it's just the road scar as of um, earlier this year. Okay, then we flash forward to the fall of last year, October 2022, when the shipping containers actually began to get placed along the border road. Um, the first shipping containers arrived on Coronado National Forest around October 5th. They were being staged on an old construction light staging area, but the actual placement of the containers on the wall didn't happen until later in October. Next slide. And this is what it looked like earlier this month. I went down there on the last day um, before the closure went into effect and to, to photograph and understand the final status of the wall before it was removed. And so it's been really fascinating to see how it started in 2019, then the impacts of the federal construction, and then this state wall. And I'm hopeful that this is going to become, over time, a restoration story where we actually get to br bring it back closer to the vision of what it was like um, in 2019. Next slide. This is the view looking west. So with Montezuma Pass and Coronado National Memorial behind me, looking west towards the Santa Cruz River, the Patagonia Mountains in the distance, and this is the scale of the wall. In the beginning, when the construction started of the shipping container wall, the segments of um, metal plates were inserted between the shipping containers. This is not flat land, unlike Yuma, where they could put them flat on the ground and they would be directly in contact with each other on the side. This is a very uh, rolling hillscape. And so because the containers did not lie flat, they started welding metal plates. In the beginning, they were spending more time and welded metal plates all the way up to the top. As they tried to go faster, they stopped doing that and more gaps remained between the shipping containers. Next slide. All right, uh, so we have border wildlife study cameras in this area. This is a place where we've been studying the wildlife in the region um, since March of 2020. So we have a really excellent sense at this point, nearly three years of data of which species are actually living within the Southern Huachuca Mountains. That was a gray fox. Here we have a deer walking through the habitat. Because it's own, it was only marked by vehicle barrier, 
in this area. The animals very much used this habitat almost like there was no border there at all. Um, it was very common for us to witness deer on both sides of the border moving back and forth. Here we have some deer. You can see the eyes in the distance from an animal in Sonora following slowly <laughs> um, uh, its friend into, into the US here. Next slide. And this was a really interesting one, hunting. Here's a coyote chasing a rabbit that came mistakenly came from um, Sonora into Arizona only to be chased by a coyote. But that kind of activity, it's very normal. It's been very common for species to be using the habitat that's just, that happens to be bisected by the border. But for these species, they don't see that line in the ground. And for those that can move under or over the vehicle barrier, it's really common. We love this one. Here's a, a coyote pack on both sides of the border. And this is all before the shipping container wall reached these locations. It's just really fun to see the animals in their natural environment using the border as they have for many, many generations, you know, tens of thousands of years. So our cameras kept watch as the shipping container wall began to be built. First, there was a lot of grading of the road. They significantly widened the road that runs in parallel with the border. And large trucks came in bringing the shipping containers into place. Um, the shipping container work uh, happened pretty quickly. The crews were not too concerned about the impact on the forest or the containers were just um, dropped pretty quickly. So within a day, we could see them grade a road in a location, bring in the shipping containers and continue to march west. And so here comes a retain, uh, container being placed. The containers were placed on the southern side of the border road. Um, in some cases, 10, 15 feet north of the actual uh, border fence and uh, vehicle barrier. In other cases, it was pretty close to the vehicle barrier, but it was all on the US side. And here's a, a longer video, a drone footage of just how much activity was going on. There would be a ha handful, five, sometimes even 10 or more trucks going in, in unison through this area. You can see there's a circle of dusty road where these uh, trucks are going by many new pullouts, parking areas for the construction equipment, places where they moved the soil were pushed into new um, areas. So one of the biggest shocks of all of this was just how much habitat disturbance happened during the installation. And there are many that have concerns, including myself, about how much more damage might be happening now during the remo removal process. It is the same crews that did the initial uh, wall installation and initial habitat destruction are now taking the containers out as fast as they can. So we are concerned that the status of the forest prior to the wall coming down um, might be in worse condition when we eventually go back into the area. Next slide. So I'm going to show you two satellite images, and this shows a stretch of the border where the shipping container wall activity happened. And if you look at the center line, that's the border road that I was just showing you. Generally, you can see a few connecting roads that come north to south down to the border, and you can see the areas where water crossings, where you see darker green vegetation snaking along washes, creek areas. But generally, this is the footprint. This is what it looked like before the shipping container activity came to this location. So this was the end of October. Next slide. And then if we look at it almost a month later, you can see all these other loops of roads that were put in, and it's extensive. So it's just been a sort of a, a fascinating and horrible thing to watch to see how much extra infrastructure road and damage came into the area, in addition to just setting um, shipping containers. I know and on some on one hand, it feels like shipping containers are temporary and how much damage could they do? But it was really the associated disturbance that's going to have the, the long term impact along the border here. Next slide. 
Here's an example of one of the, the many dozens of oak trees that were bulldozed and knocked over or cut down during the course of the road widening, parking of construction equipment, and just no, no care and attention was, was held in order to keep the, the forest intact during the construction project. This video shows the aftermath of <laughs> rain coming. It turns out when you block waterways with shipping containers and steel plates and bulldoze dirt down um, into low-lying areas and it rains, they become dams. So we've witnessed many, many places where water crossings have been plugged. They turned into lakes. These are gonna have many issues, not just on the US side, but also on the Mexican side, because in this area, many, some waterways flow south to north into the U.S., which may be blocked, and then likewise flowing um, out of the Wichucas down south into Mexico. All right, so this is a mountain lion that came through and was exploring the habitat after the shipping container wall uh, was installed. And we did see the, the mountain lion about six weeks ago checking out this area. It was picked up on several cameras. So just, just for us really emphasizes the fact that this is a real habitat change. This is a true and significant barrier, even with the gaps that were in there between them. Um, it does change the dynamics of where animals are moving. Next slide. Now, all of this sounds really bad, but I want to tell you there's a lot of hope that happened. There were some really amazing things that happened as we kept watch over this area. Um, there were community members from really all around the country that came and decided to be present to witness and to do what they could to stop the construction activity. Um, uh, it was named Camp Ocelot by the community members that assembled down in the shipping container construction areas. And they were there in all weather over the winter when it got really cold and started to snow to be there to protest the fact that this construction activity was happening at all on federal land and also to try to stop the construction activities or at least slow them down. And they were really successful. So the protesters were able to prevent probably um, six and a half miles of the total 10 planned miles of shipping container wall from being built. And that's significant given how much habitat destruction came along with the placement of those containers. Every container that didn't get placed along the border here helped protect the oak woodland forest. And we're really grateful for so many people that braved the cold and gave so generously their time to be down there to stop the wall. We also saw a lot of animals, if you go back one slide, finding ways through the shipping containers. And I think that was one of the, the, the silver linings of all of this is understanding that the imperfect nature of this junkyard wall did allow animals to pass through in places where they hadn't welded it shut. And so here, I think this illustrates it really well with the snow and all of the, the rabbit tracks going back and forth <laughs> to the shipping containers. Okay, next one. Here are some um, images from Russ McSpadden at the Center for Biological Diversity, just showing the snowscape, what it was like down there over the winter while the community was waiting for the government to intervene and really to stop the shipping container activity, which they did. And we heard before Christmas this year that the, that the Justice Department was taking action and I'm gonna let Dinah describe what happened in more detail. Next slide. All right, well, a little bit more joyful imagery of the animals having fun. I think we'll probably play this one a couple of times, Megan. Um, here are some hooded skunks playing chase <laughs> under and then around the shipping containers. Um, this one just really made me smile. The, the shipping container didn't quite uh, span the, the ground very well and there was a gap. And so th this pair was having fun running around um, underneath them and through them. Next video. Here's a coyote just doing, doing its thing, running along the border road. This is something that we saw very often prior to the, through the um, containers coming in. So it was nice to see them going about their business next to the shipping containers. And here we actually have Javelina that finally found after a few weeks, they found this gap and they were using it to move back and forth between Arizona and Sonora. Next, next video. 
and a ringtail showed up. So here's a ringtail. I don't think it could cross in this location. The steel plates were blocking between um, the shipping containers, but it was fun to see this, this animal. And here's a gray fox running along the same area. So animals became more bold. They started coming down to the shipping container wall. At first, they were really repelled by all the noise and the destruction, and they weren't there, but they became more curious. And we, we were documenting how many times and which species animals have come up and approached the shipping container wall. And here's a deer, a little bit hesitant, but the deer were one of the species we noticed disappeared for a while, soon as the shipping container activities started. But in the, the final days before they began the removal, the deer started coming back um, down to the border. Okay, well, I'm gonna end here and pass it to Dinah, but I leave you with this image from 2019. This is my vision. This is where we wanna go. <laughs> we wanna return it back to what it was. Um, we'll start by taking stock and inventory of what actually happened environmentally with the landscape, the water crossings, the, the oak trees and the other vegetation and the wildlife habitat once the closure order lifts and then working collaboratively with the forest and other partners in the area to do everything we can to bring the ecological integrity back to this beautiful landscape. Okay, with that, we can, um, pa I'll pass it to Dinah and Megan, you can stop sharing. Thank you. Emily, you've got one question on chat about whether or not Sky Island's cameras were uh, damaged during the construction. Do you wanna go ahead and answer that? Uh, yeah, one was damaged directly by the, the road grading when they started bulldozing, they, they came and they flagged the oak tree that our camera was on. They looked right at it and then they bulldozed the tree anyway. So we had we did suffer one camera loss that was felt intentional. Um, other cameras were the view shed, of course, was impacted. Sediment was piled up right in front of cameras and the view was obstructed. But the only physical damage in the fall was from one camera. We don't know what we'll find when we go back after the wall has been removed and the construction crews have gone through again. So. You know, we're prepared that there could be more losses, <laughs> but we will replace them because this is a really important place to continue the border monitoring. Okay, so um, I know many of you probably tuned in to the uh, seminar that webinar that Sky Island hosted on November 1st, I think it was last year. Uh, on this topic and I went into a fair amount of detail about the legal issues then I'm not going to um, repeat that level of detail, but I wanted to give a quick summary for context for any of you who had not joined that webinar. If you want more detail on the legal issues that are now being resolved, um, I think that webinar is still on Sky Island's website and available to watch. Um, but uh, the, the process of putting, so as to start at the beginning here on the Arizona shipping containers, the process actually started much earlier than most of us realized. And I say that because several years ago, the Arizona legislature actually authorized a fund for private donations to build border wall on state and private land. And that fund thankfully failed. They got almost no money at all. Um, so we all breathed a sigh of relief. And then when the Arizona legislature appropriated $55 million in uh, fiscal year 2021, I think many of us were so focused on the Trump wall, we just didn't, and we kind of thought, well, they're trying again for state lands and private lands for landowners that want to sell. Um, but in June of 2022, they added uh, $335 million to that uh, other appropriation. <clears throat> so the Arizona legislature ended up appropriating and in, in, uh, combined uh, 21, 22, $390 million specifically for barriers, either physical or virtual, on the Arizona wall. And again, we were really not focusing in hindsight enough and weren't thinking that they were going to put them on federal land because and most of the Arizona border, of course, is federal land or reservation land. So we were all very surprised by Governor Ducey's move in August to issue the executive order directing the placement of shipping containers. And that started right away after that executive order in the Yuma area that Emily's already described. 
and then a little later in the Coronado. Both, both the Bureau of Reclamation on the Yuma sector, whose land the shipping containers went on, and the Forest Service on the for the Coronado National Forest sent letters objecting to the placement of the shipping containers and saying it was illegal. Um, Governor Ducey brushed that off and actually went to federal court himself and filed a complaint on October 21st, alleging that the state, this was actually state land that somehow when Arizona had become a state, this federal land had magically turned into state land despite the fact that the Enabling Act says exactly the opposite. <laughs> Um, and asked the court to declare it state land and that everything and declare that what he was doing was legal. Um, as I discussed in the last seminar, these are issues that were resolved somewhere between 17 and in a series of cases between about 1790 and the mid 1800s. So no one was really expecting um, these legal issues to come up again. In uh, late November, the feds, the federal government filed a terrific response and a motion to dismiss uh, with all the obvious legal uh, rejoinders to this. Um, and then in uh, December, mid-December, uh, the Department of Justice filed a separate complaint against Governor Ducey with a number of demands about removing the shipping containers and paying for the damage. Um, and then lo and behold, on December 21st, as a bit of a Christmas present, uh, the state, and after Governor Ducey clearly was not going to remain governor, I might add, the state of Arizona and the federal government um, signed a stipulation which required the state to remove all the shipping containers on a fairly fast schedule. They uh, required them to remove all the containers in Yuma by January 4th and understanding that the removal on the Coronado was going to be much more complicated, required a certain amount of consultation with the Forest Service and uh, removal as quickly as possible in a safe manner from the Coronado National Forest. That stipulation did not waive anybody's legal theories uh, or claims in court. It simply dealt with the removal of the shipping containers um, and that, as Emily has already said, has happened in Yuma. The shipping containers went to the Yuma jail and the shipping containers off the Coronado are also going to jail in uh, the Tucson area, for those of you who are familiar with it, off of Houghton and Old Vale Road. Um, so, uh, and there's a whole lot of discussion going on about getting those containers out of jail, so to speak, and using them for a more positive purpose. Um, but that is a separate conversation. The uh, shipping container, the, the state amended the contract. They've amended the contract with Ashbrit a number of times, and they amended it again to require the contractor to remove the shipping containers. Um, uh, another $9 million plus for removal from the, from the Yuma area and another $57 million plus from the Coronado National Forest. So um, while Governor Ducey was still in office, the federal government moved to consolidate those two cases in federal court, which is a very typical action. Uh, the state uh, vehemently opposed that and made it clear that while they had agreed to take the shipping containers off, at least the Ducey administration had no intention of conceding that the land along the border, uh, which is public lands and has no different legal status than Grand Canyon National Park, uh, they were clinging to their claim that this was state land. Um, Governor Hobbs, our new and present, thankfully, <laughs> governor, made it clear both during the campaign and since she's been sworn in that her belief is this is not state land uh, and that you know she had no intention of pursuing that claim and thought the shipping container should be removed. So the parties agreed to ask for a stay of all the proceedings and the ju both judges in the two separate cases, the one brought by the state and one brought by the federal government, um, agreed to stay all the deadlines for all the various briefs that were due back and forth for 30 days to give the new administration, the state's administration, a chance to kind of <laughs> catch up and decide what to do next. And 
a status report is required in both cases um, and February 3rd and February 4th. That doesn't mean they will come to a conclusion. In fact, I'm pretty sure they, I would be surprised if they do come to a conclusion uh, that soon. What it's much more likely to happen is they'll give the court a status report, which will be public, and then um, there'll be a continuance of the stay while uh, I suspect that the part of the state and the federal government will um, negotiate a settlement in this case. It's hard to see, given Governor Hobbs' public statements, uh, how she would want to pursue the legal claims. Um, and the federal government, while their most immediate uh, ask uh, of the courts was to order removal of the shipping containers, their separate lawsuit also asked the state to pay for the remediation efforts and pay damages and to you know, forswear any claim to federal land, et cetera, et cetera. So they're going to want those issues resolved. Um, obviously, what's on the minds of many people uh, watching the border here in Arizona, particularly the people that sat there in the snow and amazingly were able to stop uh, many of the shipping containers from going on, but many others like uh, Emily and, and the Sky Island crew that's been monitoring that area for several years. Uh, is the remediation. And I think it's gonna be very difficult to make an assessment of uh, what remediation is needed and the costs until the shipping containers are completely removed. So that's one of the reasons I'm, I would be very surprised if they reach a settlement agreement by early February when the containers are still being removed. Um, so that's pretty much where we are now is, uh, you know, waiting for the Coronado shipping containers to uh, finish being removed and put in jail and uh, the attorneys reporting to the court. And as I said, probably negotiating a settlement. I don't know that, but that just would be the uh, kind of obvious thing to do. Um, so uh, best case would be, of course, the state um, forswears any legal claim to that area. Otherwise, I think the federal government would, would have a very major problem. Again, the governor has already indicated her belief it's not federal. So I think most of the activities or most of the negotiations are likely to be around remediation costs and damages. Um, so with that, that's my quick wrap up <laughs> or update. And we seem to have a variety of questions here. Oh, Emily's posted the full presentation from the last time on the chat. Yeah, thanks, Dinah. It's been a fascinating six months, hasn't it? <laughs> I guess yes. if you watch the border, it's always fascinating. And this is just the latest, latest chapter for us here. Um, okay, so just going back to look at the questions that have been coming in. And again, please feel free to chime in if you have any, if you have comments or questions that you'd like us to address. Uh, so there's some questions about further west of where we've been talking about with Coronado National Forest, um, Oregon Pipe, Cactus National Monument, and specifically Quito Big Quito Springs. What do we know about the the situation there? I don't know if you want to say anything, Dinah, and then I can share. Yeah, I mean. um, I, I've talked about the land manager and um, uh, the, the elder in the Tahona Autumn Nation that has spent a lot of time uh, working on Quito Piquito, former head of the Natural Resources Department for the Town Auto Nation. There is a concern going on right now that, um, I mean, there, there were two things that affected Quito Piquito. Before border wall construction, there was already a problem because uh, the water was leaking out of the pond and the water was going down. So the Park Service um, had already planned to drain the pond and put in a liner, which they did. They very carefully uh, moved uh, the turtles and the endangered fish that live in Quito Piquito and put the liner in and filled it up. Then the water went down during the construction. The water went back up. Uh, I don't think all the way to the original level, but it seemed to be going there. And then it started going down again. And what both uh, Lorraine Eiler with the Tona Auto Nation told me and Scott Stoneham, um, the supervisor of Oregon Pipe, is that they believe, unfortunately, they believe there is a tear in the liner. And I mean, the idea of having to take that liner off <laughs> and do all this over is rather horrifying. 
they, they think maybe it's on the side and that they won't have to drain the whole thing, but they're trying to figure that out right now. So that's the, the status of that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, I can just add that organ pipe, it did get federal border wall, the 30 foot wall was constructed during the Trump administration, it went across many different low water crossing areas, um, affected bosques, of course, the draining of Quito Bikito, as Diana just said, that was from the actual construction, um, pumping no, it water. Wasn't, it wasn't from border wall construction, it was already yeah. planned. <laughs> Oh, okay. There have been some reports that water levels were dropping related to the construction, but it was dropping. It okay. was dropping. But both but, things were happening. They were going to put a liner in and it dropped because of border well construction. Got it. Sorry. So what I understand from park staff in terms of the issues with the existing border infrastructure really has to do with the disruption of water flow over the border, the water crossings, concern about border lighting that have put in and the lack of sufficient wildlife crossing structures in the wall itself. So those are some of the, the natural resource issues um, of concern for, for Oregon Pipe. Okay, so we talked about where the shipping containers have been taken. Um, there's been some uh, commentary about the who's monitoring the environmental damage as these containers are being removed. And, and thank you, Michael, for, for replying. Um, our cameras are there. If they're still there, they are monitoring what's happening in set locations. So we're monitoring the wild, the wildlife populations. And um, yeah, as Michael said, there are some of our um, partners and other organizations did have a permit that was revoked that was going to allow them permission to be in the closure area to keep to bear witness to the removal process. Um, so to the best of our knowledge, it's only us for is now of the removal processes. Um, there is a question about, are there any discussions about pursuing legal action, either civil or criminal against Governor Ducey personally? No, I mean, the Arizona legislature again passed $390 million to do this. <laughs> And when the legislature appropriates money, the executive branch is actually supposed to use it for that purpose. That's why we actually have a problem on the federal border wall side is because Congress appropriated billions of dollars for that. And there's still some remaining funds from fiscal year uh, uh, 19, 20, or 20 and 21 now. And uh, I think you're gonna see the House Republicans make a huge uh, issue about the fact that the administration hasn't spent that money yet on border wall. The administration has asked them to rescind that money, but the Congress has not done so even in the last two Congresses. But there's no grounds, you know, to be honest, to sue <laughs> Governor Ducey. Um, and, and you can't sue the, for doing what the legislature told them to do and appropriated $390 million for. And no, you can't sue the legislature for passing a bad law. So that the remedy for that is called an election. And unfortunately, we didn't quite make it this time on the state legislator, legislature front, but there's always the next election. Yes, for sure. Well, my, my Zoom closed and I'm afraid I lost the previous chat. So I'm gonna need some help um, with questions that came in from after what we were just talking about. Uh, okay, I can, I can do that. Uh, the next question, Emily, is for you. Are there plans for Sky Island Alliance to report on wildlife monitoring before, during, and after border wall construction? Yes, absolutely. That's one of our um, cur current applications of our border wildlife study data. In March, on March 9th, we're actually going to be giving a full overview of all of the data results that we have in hand from our, our research study of wildlife in this area. Some of the after impacts of the shipping container wall on the wildlife population we may not have yet, but that'll be three years into the study. We're doing our wildlife community studies so that we can understand how border infrastructure affects the wildlife in our region and how it's moving between and how they are moving or not being able to move between uh, Arizona and Sonora. So that's a key focus and we'll be reporting about that. We also have projects ongoing in the San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge um, in partnership with Wildlands Network where border wall is there. And then we have seasonal gate openings. We're looking at 
any potential avenues that animals might be using to be crossing back and forth. And I'm excited to say we're gonna be installing an array of cameras in the San Pedro. We're starting on Monday. So we'll be replicating our study in a new location. The San Pedro is a major um, riparian corridor that also crosses the border. Great. Okay, then there's a couple of related questions. Um, maybe I missed this, but are there any restoration efforts in the works for when the boxcars are moved? And another question, any citizen efforts that we can get involved in to push for quality remediation? Really, um, uh, the federal, right now, again, what's going on is federal government and the state trying to figure out what to do. And a big part of that, I suspect the main part of that is focused on remediation. Um, there's not a role for the public in that directly. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention was that um, there are interveners on both sides of these cases, and one of the interveners is Center for Biological Diversity. Um, there's, long story short, there's two ways to intervene or to, um, to statuses of intervention. One is by right, like if they had put shipping containers right on, uh, say, the Center for Biological Diversity's land, they would have intervention, hopefully, but right, uh, or permissive. Um, they have permissive intervention. The government may, the federal government may decide to consult with them um, about remediation or may not. That's uh, optional, and right now, I, I, I don't think that has happened yet, uh, or at least as far as I know. Um, but uh, I think it's I don't think much is going to happen in terms of remediation until the state and the federal government work out the, the legal issues, presumably in a settlement. Uh, Rachel, but then, I mean, I, I'm confident that it will, there will be a resolution of this, but it's not going to be instant. The settlement is going to take longer than the stipulation to get the shipping containers off the land. Uh, which was to stop it and to take them off, which was the most uh, urgent of the of the issues. But obviously, it would be great to get remediation started, presumably by spring, if at all possible. Yeah, so could start growing. The remediation plan for the Tucson sector did include uh, dealing with some of the original federal construction staging yeah. areas that do overlap with this. So that'll be interesting to see how that factors in. And there was a lot of community input and we believe DHS did say they were gonna work on some road removal. So that's on the Eastern side of the shipping container area. There were some plans to deal with remediation and some restoration related to the federal project. So now we've got layers of <laughs> different construction <laughs> and potential avenues for, for, for healing this area. And uh, Rachel Arney put up a video of the border wall resistance in the chat, if you want to see that. Uh, then there's another question about, is there any chance of acquiring one of the shipping containers? I'd love to make a guest house from one or renting it to a migrant worker. Uh, there is a live conversation, as I understand it, with uh, Governor Hobbs, I mean, Governor Hobbs being part of it. And she's already said publicly she's interested in repurposing the shipping containers possibly is used for homeless communities. There are a number of homeless uh, nonprofits who focused on homeless groups that are active in this. A number of people in the border coalition are interested in it. Uh, and my understanding is the governor's office is working on a proposal. It's not yet ready for the public, but hopefully we'll hear about that soon. Whether or not it will allow for individuals uh, purchasing shipping containers as opposed to nonprofits or uh, municipalities I have, uh, or tribal nations, I have no idea. We'll just have to wait and, and see on that. Uh, I've already answered no, there's no personal liability on Governor Ducey. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that, folks, but, you know, it's a lesson we need to focus on the legislature because he couldn't have done this if the leg and wouldn't have done it. I, I have no reason to believe he would have done it if he hadn't had direction and $390 million from the Arizona legislature. So um, I spent a long time in the executive office of the president and my professional career, and I've always found that all of us focus too much on the executive branch and not enough on the legislative branch, which is actually the entity that makes the laws and appropriates the money. Uh, Emily, one, uh, well, I certainly don't know the answer to this. You may. Has there been any public comment or press release from the Nature Conservancies nearby Rancho Los Fresnos Preserve in Mexico or other Mexican conservation groups? 
Um, not to not to the best of my knowledge. And the shipping container wall did extend onto the northeastern border of Rancho Los Fresnos, um, which is for, if you're not familiar with it, it's just south of Coronado National Forest. It's a it's a fabulous property. Um, so we've been down there, our team has, and other community members have, have been invited by TNC to look at what's happening, and we are interested in helping TNC document any damages that have happened from the shipping container wall on the property to the south, but they, to the best of my knowledge, they haven't taken any action. We generally do not see Mexican entities taking a position of opposition to border infrastructure. This is really considered an American problem, <laughs> and there hasn't been widespread um, opposition or any vocal groups that have really come out in front in terms of, of opposing it. But that is something we're hoping to change and to have more um, mm -hmm. collaboration with Mexican groups. In terms of conservation and concerns about the issues, they yeah, are sure. sentiments that are shared across uh, conservation assays in Sonora. Um, um, but that public policy statements we haven't seen um, at all. I don't know if you've seen them ever, Dinah, but I certainly no, I've been working against federal border wall and the waiver of laws for 23 years, and um, I have never seen a Mexican entity uh, speaking out against it in the nonprofit world. And um, yeah, it's it's pretty bad. Uh, it's a shame because Mexico obviously has treaties with the United States that you know might be relevant and obviously are affected physically and functionally by the border wall, but uh, as the environmental attache to the Mexican government once said to me, Mexico City is as far away from the border as Washington DC is from the border and they don't really understand the issues. He did, but was not able to have much of an influence at the time, just as many of us in the government who were objecting to it didn't have much influence at the time. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a shame. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, there are, uh, there are a number of comments about the need to use the shipping containers as something positive. And again, many people are working on that and the governor has supported that. And we're hoping to see a proposal from the governor's office probably laying out a process to do that. There are 4,202 shipping containers in all. So we're dealing with a much larger number than any of the uh, nonprofits or muni municipalities that have dealt with, uh, have used shipping containers. And Rachel has also posted a video about that, uh, have ever handled at one time. So I'm, I'm guessing there may be a system where, you know, different groups or municipalities or governments, local governments um, apply for a certain number of shipping containers. All but 512 of those 4,202 shipping containers are 40 feet long and the rest are 20 feet long. There are some issues. Um, I've learned a little bit about shipping containers over the last few months. And one of the things I've learned is some of the shipping containers have toxic material inside of them uh, that you certainly don't want somebody living in <laughs> Uh, that so um, besides just fixing them up so they're nicer to live in and have some amenities, uh, they may. We, I have no idea whether or not these particular shipping containers have toxic material that would have to be removed first. But it's it's uh, going to take some money, I suspect, to convert the shipping containers. How much we don't know to something that could be useful. Um, yes, uh, there's a comment about treaties with indigenous tribes as well. That is true. Uh, I will tell you that, I mean, the, the tribe that obviously has the largest area on the border is the Tan Odom uh, nation. They do not have a treaty with the United States. It's something that was explored very early on 20 some years ago because of border wall construction. They have no pedestrian wall on the reservation and they uh, hopefully never will. And they do have a legal status that would require Congress to take land out of trust, which would be very problematic politically. Um, however, uh, that is only on the reservation. And as, as one of their lawyers said in a conference call about 22 years ago, <laughs> We don't have a treaty because we didn't fight the United States government, uh, you know, in terms of battles like a lot of other uh, tribes did. So, um, but they do have status certainly as a recognized tribe, federally recognized tribe, and so the that's why the reservation has no pedestrian wall. They have 
uh, their leadership has said they will, um, there will be a wall, a pedestrian wall there over quote, our dead body. Uh, has any bollard wall come down? Uh, no, could the remaining funds be used to tear the wall down? No, that's state money, not federal money. The bollard wall is federal wall. And even if the state, first of all, the state legislature, I'm concerned, it, which is still dominated by the same party that appropriated 390, mile, uh, $390 million for border wall is not going to be really excited about the governor repurposing these for uh, a positive use for homeless or other uh, potential positive uses. So they may really uh, try and throw a roadblock, all puns intended, um, in a more positive use of these. But uh, at any rate, it's state funds. They certainly wouldn't be used to take down federal wall. Um, I think the last one, Dinah, is just about uh, Senator Kelly, if he's taken um, an yeah. interest or in this. Um, I'm not aware. Well, it did say he understood the frustration. So can, Senator Kelly, in my view, has really tried to craft a middle of the road <laughs> approach on the border wall, which is somewhat hard to do. But uh, in that he did, he has supported the federal government closing the quote gaps in the Yuma sector. On the other hand, he also has opposed border wall in uh, early on in his first campaign in the Guadalupe Canyon Malpai borderlands area. And he's remained silent as far as I know about the um, shipping containers in the, on the Coronado. Uh, so that's what I know there. Um, you mentioned there is still federal money left for wall building. Could it be repurposed? Well, that only if Congress re, re essentially repurposes it. Uh, the administration has asked ever since the Biden administration came in Congress to uh, approve transferring that money to the Department of the Interior and the Forest Service for remediation and Congress has refused to do it. Very sadly, and it's certainly not gonna happen in the next two years now with the House. Right. The House has always passed it. The last two years, the House did pass that. It always died in the Senate. Now, obviously, the House is not going to pass it. So unfortunately, no, the administration is stuck with that. Well, thank you, Dinah, for all of this. And thank you all for tuning in. Um, the border is constantly changing, and it takes a lot of uh, experts and groups and supporters to keep our attention focused on it. Um, many people tuned out once Biden was elected. We can't do that. Border infrastructure is always going to be threatening our region. And what we're hoping for in the year ahead, while we can't change probably the, the appropriation of funding, is we're really looking to see how can we make the habitats as, as um positive for wildlife as possible? Can we work with DHS and Customs and Border Protection to improve wildlife connectivity across the border, improve watershed connectivity, and of course the work to support migrants and their, their the continued need to have sane and uh, humane policies for people that are needing to migrate are a top priority. We will continue to share information and updates about the border as we learn them. And thank you from the bottom of my heart, Dinah, for sharing what you know and for helping us try to make sense of this crazy border world that we're living in. <laughs> so thank and you, you for actually monitoring and watching it and doing the analysis on the impacts. Yeah, and Sky Island generally. Oh, Great job. You. Well, thank you all. I will send out a copy of this recording when it's ready. And um, thank you all for tuning in. Take care.